Good evening to everyone. Our speaker today is Divna Manolova. Divna is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Medieval Literature at the University of York and at the University of Southern Denmark, where she's working uh, on theories of space and uh, dimensionality in Byzantine cosmological and astronomical uh, texts and diagrams. Before coming to York, Divna was the principal investigator of a very interesting uh, project with the title Polymathy and Intellectual Curiosity in Byzantine Discourses of Science and Philosophy from 13th century to the 15th centuries. Uh, this project was funded by the European Union Horizon uh, 2020. Today, Divna is going to talk about um, uh, abstraction and observation, uh, about um, astrolabes, globes, and mirrors in the medieval Mediterranean. Our respondent for today is my uh, former colleague and uh, good friend, Karin Ibali, who is now in uh, John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University, and uh, who also works on uh, mirrors, on the moon, and on astronomy. We thank you both for being with us today. And dear Divna, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. <clears throat> I hope everybody can hear and see me. And if during the presentation you cannot, please unmute yourself, shout at me, <laughs> uh, alert me to the difficulties you're experiencing. And um, as I go, I think I will say many thanks to uh, several people I see in the audience. Um, and some of them I knew they were coming, so they are building in my talk. But I want to say now specific thanks to several people I see who, together with me today, attended a doctor of defense for three hours. So they are real heroes for having come to this talk as well. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for making this effort and uh, joining me today. Um, I will share now my PowerPoint with you. And I think you should be able to see it now. Um, so before I get to the real paper for today, uh, I also feel I should start by listing uh, a number of excuses, which are very unapologetically aimed at persuading you to be kind and forgiving as you listen to what I have to say. Um, I also feel I should mention uh, that even though this is a lecture series focused on antiquity, today you're going to listen to a medievalist. And secondly, uh, that this is a lecture series focused on medicine and technology. Uh, and I will tell you a little bit about technology, but I fear a lot more concerning the representation and observation of astronomical phenomena. And even though I feel a little bit that I have little to add to the content of the series, I'm really, really grateful for uh, the invitation because it was the first opportunity to work with Maria and with George and the uh, opportunity to meet Karen, whose work I have been reading throughout the years. And now finally, we actually can be in dialogue together and um, even see each other on the screen, which is really wonderful. Uh, and one technical note, um, I mentioned this to Maria and to George in the beginning. Um, as this is a Zoom, now we are in this era of Zoom presentations and recordings. Um, I, um, I, I feel I'm, I was not very well organized in applying for permissions for all the images I'm going to show you today. And for those, I didn't succeed having the permission on time uh, to include them in my PowerPoint. Uh, on those occasions, I will stop sharing the PowerPoint and share um, the image from the browser, from the website of the library which as you can see, gives us some additional possibilities because we can really zoom in and see more details. When you um, read the, the, my paper's title, which you see on the screen, and I, uh, you, you heard in Maria's uh, introduction, you can see that it's a very verbose title. Um, and I'm sure you also realized that, you, you realized that when I was asked to submit this, I really didn't know what exactly I'm going to speak about, which is why I included everything I could possibly speak about. <laughs> um, and that's why you see the medieval Mediterranean, even though I'm uh, primarily a Byzantinist, uh, and that's why you see astrolabes and globes and mirrors um, and yeah, pretty much everything. 
And obviously, there is no way I can cover everything in the medieval Mediterranean uh, as far as astronomical technology is concerned in uh, 30 minutes. Um, and But I also think it is not necessary to do that uh, for my purpose today, which is really to invite you to think together with me about the first part of the title. So about the spectrum uh, of cosmological and astronomical representations, um, a spectrum that unfolds between the bookends, let's say, of abstraction and observation. So basically of things that can be directly seen, a phenomena that can we can actually observe, and those that we know uh, or they knew existed and wanted to explain but couldn't observe. Um, therefore, the questions I'm interested in uh, concern observation of the natural world and of the sky and the celestial phenomena in particular. Some astronomical bodies and phenomena render themselves to observation partially or as a whole. Uh, and one such example is a solar eclipse, which is something that ancient and medieval people uh, could observe as much as we can today with the naked eye. And um, just a couple of weeks ago here in the UK, um, I, and I guess you as well, we could observe a partial sol solar eclipse. And as you can see on this slide, I could even take an amateur photo with my phone. So th that's how much it, it is actually possible to see um, when you have a phenomenon such as the eclipse. Then, of course, there are other phenomena uh, which cannot be observed without the mediation or without the technology, technical mediation of an instrument, or they cannot be observed at all. And hence, they become the subject of uh, the imagination, of fantasia. And they are also subject to representation in, uh, when they are treated scientifically or for the purposes of education, for instance. So you can consider some very contemporary examples. For instance, uh, the new, um, recently hot topic of uh, all the new exoplanets that astronomers have been discovering. And uh, I am showing you here an artist rendering of one of those worlds, the Trappist 1F exoplanet, which, um, so this is how an artist imagined how that world might look like. And the original caption released with the image by NASA uh, reads, this is the artist's concept. The artist co this artist's concept allows us to imagine what it would be like to stand on the surface of the exoplanet Therapist 1F, which is located in the eponymous system in the constellation of Aquarius. And uh, just as a side note, I really like the name of that world because some of you who have lived in Hungary may know that there is this uh, Hungarian cheese called Trapit. So every time I read about this exoplanet, I think about the cheese and I just imagine the cheesy planet. <laughs> but basically you see this, uh, that, that the concept of knowing that such a planet exists, having certain amount of data about how it may be and what, let's say, the view from its surface may look like, for instance, how many moons and suns you might see above the horizon. However, this is certainly something we cannot really observe uh, from our viewpoint on Earth. Therefore, such a uh, drawing has been prepared by NASA for a variety of purposes, not just educational, but you know, we can think of promotional, for funding, et cetera, et cetera. And another such example that I think many of you might be familiar with of something that we cannot actually something that has been observed, but through a technological innovation. This is the famous uh, picture of the black hole um, taken by the Event Horizon Telescope uh, system. So in, this is a case where observation is possible, but through a major technological breakthrough. So this is from 2019. Both cases illustrate the attempt to visualize in order to represent, exemplify, and explain but also in order to study and understand a phenomenon of the physical universe. In the case of the black hole, a technological breakthrough, namely the Event Horizon Telescope Network, makes the visualization possible. In the case of the exoplanet, an artist's rendering is used by NASA in order to help us imagine the world of Trappist 1F. There are many aspects of both images we can discuss here, uh, but I would like for you to retain only a couple at this moment and to use this as a bridge to our subsequent discussion of medieval representations. In particular, I would like you to consider first the importance of visual representation for the study of the cosmos, and second, the ways in which visual cognition operates. 
And my paper today is an attempt to touch upon those questions. Um, thus, I would like to focus on devices uh, such as, for instance, instruments like the astrolabe, astrolabe or the globe, but also an abstract representation such as the diagrams or illustrations such as the drawing and the sketch, which allow the inquiring mind to see what is otherwise invisible or unobservable. The object of observation slash contemplation may be invisible due to the observer's viewpoint, the distance between the observer and their object, or indeed due to the scale on which the object is positioned. For instance, while for a human observer, it is impossible to see our planetary system in its entirety, they can imagine and represent it through an armillary sphere or a planetary model diagram. Thus, the question of abstraction and representation is important for my discussion, but so is also the question of observation, and thus of vision, of sight, light, and color, of shadows and reflections. For this reason, in my core case study for today, in the final part of the, of the talk, I would like to think together with you uh, and with the help of uh, Karen as my respondent about mirrors, uh, reflections, and shadows, and to do that, I will use as a basis for the discussion of 14th century, early 14th century Byzantine text I have been working for some time on for some time now. And this is the short treatise on the moon by the Thessalonian author Demetrius Taitlinius. And as I point in my abstract, this is all work in progress. I have no definite answers, but I really would like to think together with you, as I rarely have the chance to think together with people who actually do work on science and technology all the time. And um, now I move to the first of two parts of, uh, of this talk, where I just want to give you a brief su survey of what we know about instruments in Byzantium. A couple of years ago, Immaculada Pegas Martin and I conducted a preliminary research into the extant references in literature to scientific instruments, not only astronomical ones, but also. And uh, for this, we used both texts and manuscripts we did this because we were writing a companion chapter for this companion to Byzantine science, which finally exists. And that chapter was dedicated to education. So as this was a companion chapter, our survey was not at all extensive and comprehensive, but still I think quite representative of the material we have to deal with. And basically our conclusion was that while there were very interesting examples, we really had to come the sources to find um, references that we can put count on our ten, on our two hands, on our fingers. So basically, while there might be a lot of evidence, we really have to go through all the sources to discover them. And still, it will be a more limited collection that what, than what we find in other medieval cultures, for instance, in the Islamic hate world, where we have really an abundance of astronomical instruments that survive. However, I can show you some examples and I can mention them. Uh, for instance, we know of some relatively early um, fifth to seventh century uh, geared instruments and uh, geared calendrical instruments and sundials that survive. We also know of uh, parallactic instruments. And here I can show you a sketch of such an instrument uh, from a manuscript. This is a ninth century manuscript preserved in Florence. So this is the, it is called Paralacticon Organon uh, in the manuscript. Uh, so while we don't have the instrument, we have the schema for, for it. And uh, another famous uh, instrument is what is often referred to as the sole surviving uh, Byzantine astrolabe, or rather an astrolabe with Greek inscriptions on it, which is preserved in a museum in Brescia and dates to 1062. And I'm showing you a reconstruction of that instrument from uh, a museum in Thessaloniki. I haven't seen that in person, so I would be curious if anyone else has. Um, and that, so that instrument based on the inscriptions on its um, read is dated to 1062 and is association, associated with a commission by certain Ipatosi and Protospatarios named Sergios. And another instrument to mention, and here I owe huge thanks to uh, my colleague Maria Lidova, who I think is also with us today, and um, she was extremely efficient, and just before the beginning of this talk, she sent me one of her own images of that uh, 
that uh, instrument, which is uh, preserved in the Hermitage Museum. And as she explained to me, uh, it was for the for a long time uh, belonged in the collection of modern instruments uh, uh, because the gnomon and the disc were separated and they were in two different depositories. And only recently, recently a curator named uh, Vega Zaleskaya has um, discovered the fact that they belong together and that allowed for a redating of the instrument and moving it now into the Byzantine collection of the Hermitage Museum. Um, so I think having such, um, such new developments like redating of instruments, recognizing parts that belong together, will also eventually uh, lead us to reconsider that so surviving Byzantine astrolabe I um, started with, the one in Brescia. Uh, as I said, it dates to the 11th century and roughly around the same time, additional evidence by um, um, an intellectual called Michael Psellos, who writes that he uses a number of devices in his teaching, and that includes also images projected through the help of mirrors, for instance, Later in the 13th century, Manuel Olovolos, uh, he provides evidence that in his teaching, he is using armillary spheres. And we are also told by a 14th century author that I'm going to mention several times today, um, uh, Nikifovos Gregoras. Uh, so he uh, he's accused and criticized for the fact that in his own living quarters, he uh, they were apparently filled with spheres, books, and diagrams. Um, and yet, in comparison with the abundance of intricate astronomical instruments, uh, such as astrolabes and celestial globes used, for instance, as I mentioned in the medieval Islamic world, the surviving material culture of the Byzantine astronomers seems remark remarkably sparse. Just one or two astrolabes, there are no globes, no mirrors, uh, even if they're mentioned in the sources. And as far as the textual source evidence is concerned, I do believe that we really have to come through the sources very carefully to have more instances of this educational use of astronomical models and instruments. Um, but of course, I'm aware of the fact that this is a very difficult time consuming task and to be quite frank, very few people want to do it. Um, at the same time, it is also true that we do have other types of evidence which has been neglected or wrongly interpreted. And a lot of it is in fact textual or diagrammatic. To take just one ninth century example, and here I'm going to stop this sharing and share with you a different screen. So what I'm going to show you is a ninth century manuscript from the Vatican Library that is very well known it's a Ptolemy collection, but at the beginning there this additionally added, for, um, subsequently added folia also from the ninth century, but not belonging to the original binding, which show two celestial maps uh, to um, to hemispheres. So this is one on folio two verso, and if I leave through them, you would see the other one on folio two recto. And I'm going to zoom in on the first one so you can see the uh, intricacy of the design and its details. And importantly, its colors. So you can see the, I, I trust the zodiac, the Leo and the Cancer signs, for instance. So these are the um, summer and winter hemispheres uh, in Vaticanus Grecus uh, 1291. Uh, it is an, uh, uh, Uncio Codex, which contains the handy tables of Ptolemy. And it has been dated, I mean, there's a huge debate about its dating, but more or less, uh, or soon after uh, 802 to 811. It is lavishly decorated and often discussed uh, for uh, some other of its diagrams. And I think I have an example later on, but these two uh, celestial um, maps are less often discussed. Um, and these initial two full page constellation maps, uh, they have received less attention, but I want to focus on them today. Considering the fact that they were uh, nevertheless purposefully added, even though later to this Ptolemaic collection, 
I thought it might be worth highlighting the similarity between these celestial maps in the Vatican manuscript and the appearance of the celestial globe like the, in the way that it is described by Ptolemy, which based on extant ancient and medieval examples may have existed as an instrument. Ptolemy's instructions on how to construct the so-called precession globe from the Almagest uh, eight, uh, Book 8, uh, Section 3, they are of interest here as his prescription about the colors used to paint the globe relate to the summer and winter hemispheres uh, we see in the Vaticanus. And I quote from the Tumor translation, uh, Ptolemy writes, we make the color of the globe in question somewhat deep so as to resemble not the daytime, but rather the nighttime sky in which the stars actually appear. Uh, and he continues, as for the configuration of the shapes of the individual constellations, we make them as simple as possible, connecting the stars with the same figure only by lines, which moreover should not be very different in color from the general background of the globe. The purpose of this is, on the one hand, not to lose the advantages of this kind of pictorial description, and on the other, not to destroy the resemblance of the image to the original, that is the sky, by applying a variety of colors, but rather to make it easy for us to remember and to compare when we actually come to examine the starry heaven, since we will be accustomed to the unadorned appearance of the stars in their representation on the globe too. So as you can see, he recommends the dark color of the sky to be the, the globe to be in the same uh, color as the sky. And if constellations are depicted to be depicted simply and in a not very much different color so that when you use the globe, you get used to the configurations and then you can recognize them in the sky. To my mind, the miniatures in the Vaticanus appear to follow Ptolemy's instructions quite closely. To my knowledge, this is the only Byzantine example that depicts the hemispheres in a dark indigo background uh, color, similar to the actual hues of the night sky. While they present a more elaborate rendering of the constellations than that prescribed by Ptolemy, who says that you should simply connect the stars with lines, um, here, uh, we have the constellations depicted by using a combination of black and white strokes, and thus we have preserved the balance of light and dark, which is similar to what is visible on, on the night sky. And I want to give you a comparative view. So there's another set of constellation maps, which you will see are not they are not similarly colored. So this is just for the sake of comparison. Another Vatican manuscript. Um, this is from the early 14th century. It's an astronomical compendium edited and partially copied by the astronomer I had mentioned, Nikiforos Gregogas. And this is indeed a black and white uh, reproduction, but I think clearly you can see that there is no uh, dark blue background and that the constellations are sketched uh, in a very different way. Uh, and there is no such emphasis on color and resemblance with the night sky. So if both a set of maps were to, you, to, to serve as some sort of a teaching tool, then they would function very differently and teach rather different things because of the way they are colored. And it might be a stretch to suggest that celestial maps such as the ones I'm showing you in the two Vatican manuscripts provide evidence for the use of the globe as a tool for classroom instruction or that they can even substitute it. I realize that. Um, nevertheless, I do think that the survival rate of Byzantine astronomical instruments is not a sufficient indicator of their use or uh, lack thereof. Two areas in particular have been largely omitted as possible sources of information. And uh, I'm using this same manuscript to show you what I mean. So it, we have those illustrations, but we also have here Gregorasi's treatise on the astrolabe in an, um, in a, sorry, in an autograph copy. So even if we don't have this astrolabe surviving, we do have schematics that show uh, the construction of different parts of that astrolabe. So I'm just showing you some, uh, 
some folia in that manuscript. And here is the read. Uh, so I think we need to consider scientific illustration, such as this astrolabe part designs from the Vaticanus Greco 1087, which are among uh, several schematic drawings accompanying this autograph copy of Gregorasi's treatise. Um, and now I'm going to stop sharing and go to my second point of second type of evidence that I think we should be uh, considering. I'm going to return to my PowerPoint. So again, we are back with the Brescia Astrolabe and for you, and I think uh, Ben probably is in the audience. Uh, so on the cover of his most excellent book, we see um, one of the um, one of the richly illuminated folia from the first Vaticanus manuscript. So this, for instance, image has been uh, uh, very much discussed. But as I said, the uh, two hemisphere celestial maps that I mentioned have not been uh, the center of so much attention, as far as I know. Um, yeah, so uh, as I said, I think the first area that has been neglected is scientific illustrations where parts of instruments or instruments themselves have been discussed. And the second uh, area that I would like to bring to your attention is that concerns the following image. So while the evidence is extremely scarce and um, possibly non-existent in the Byzantine case, I think we should also consider the possibility of the use of paper instruments, such as, for instance, this 15th century astrolabe from the collection of the History of Science Museum in Oxford. This is extremely speculative, but it is tempting to interpret the celestial maps from the Vaticanus Grecus uh, 1291 uh, and, and to, to see them along the same lines, namely as a parchment tool for educational use, which prepared the reader to recognize the shapes of the constellations in the night sky during the different seasons. Again, I realize this is huge speculation, but I'm using the opportunity to, uh, to test it on you. And with this, I would like to move to the second part of the talk. Um, and to transition from the short survey of Byzantine astronomical instruments to the question of representation and imagination. In the second part, I would like to talk about mirrors and mirroring in particular, and about, as I mentioned, the case of the 14th century Thessalonian author, uh, Demetrius Triclinius and his selenography. And in order to do that, I would like to bring you back to the Byzantine astrolabe from the 11th century, the one preserved in Brescia, and I'm showing you again the reconstruction, uh, which you see on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, you see the transcription of, the, uh, of one of the verse inscriptions on its read. And I read my translation of that um, inscription, a vivid image of the heavens motions, visualizing clearly the course of the stars, the turns of seasons and passage of time. An image which as it is intricate, Sergius the Persian made with longing when, while he was uh, an ipotos. There is a lot to be said about the meaning of epigrammatic verse inscriptions on instruments such as this one, or to give you an earlier example, some of you may be familiar with, we know of uh, the description of Synes by Synesius of an astrolabe which features two epigrams that description is preserved in his letter to Peonius. So that's from the fourth century. For now, I would like to highlight two elements only from that uh, from this uh, verse inscription. First, the expression uh, icon and argis, a vivid image or an image manifest in Dalton's translation. It is used here for the astrolabe, astrolabe and then the subsequent, uh, we have the subsequent qualification of this image as uh, pikili, literally of many colors, diverse, or in the case of metal work, one of intricate design. Similarly, in his treatise on the astrolabe, I showed you the autograph copy of uh, just before, Grigoras noted, I quote, that the de delineation of a sphere on a flat plane is similar to painting. Zografia gartis estin. This is the subject of another paper, but I sh it should be mentioned that Sergius's astrolabe uh, as a representation and likeness of the cosmos is thus described in ekphrastic terms. 
energia and uh, peculiar vividness and variety are distinctive and valued characteristics of the rhetorical discourse as well. By its mixture of geometric and literary aesthetic, the 1062 astrolabe is embedded in the same cultural understanding as the so-called anonymous Heiberg, a quadrivium textbook dated to, 10, to one, the year 1007, so the beginning of the 11th century, uh, which survives in a 1040, in a manuscript from the year 1040. In that, that quadrivium textbook also features chapter titles, so the section on arithmetics, geometry, music, and astronomy. Those titles, for instance, um, are written in dodecasyllable verse. So again, we have poetry as part of the scientific uh, picture. The astrolabe as an image, um, icon of model, thus enabling the viewer to imagine the whole of the universe. Second, it exemplifies its intricate construction and its beauty. Finally, in addition to enabling the viewer to observe and understand the cosmos, it also demonstrates the universe in movement. And thus, it is also a representation, a reenactment, icon and argis, of celestial mechanics. In the final part of the talk and for the core case study, I would like to turn to another instrument like this astrolabe, which uh, allows for the unseen to be seen, but also like the astrolabe can capture movement. And in what remains of my time, I would like to focus on the mirror. Among the organizers of this series, there is an expert on mirrors, Maria, and I'm showing you a reference uh, to her excellent uh, co-edited collection. Uh, and I can add here on the slide a few other bibliographical references you could possibly choose to follow up on if you're interested in what we know of mirrors in Byzantium. So uh, we have Papa Ioano for the mirror as a literary metaphor. We have a chair, a Fabio Cerbi for optics in Byzantium, for instance. It is also acknowledged and uh, relatively well known that um, Ibn al Haytham was familiar with the preceding early Byzantine tradition, as for instance, the work on mirrors by Anthemion of, uh, Anthemius of Tralis. Nothing is known about the possible reception of uh, Ibn al Haytham's ideas in later Byzantium, and this will be something interesting to pursue uh, further or as a side project. As I have mentioned, in the 11th century, Psalos gave us evidence for the use of mirrors in teaching. And in the late 13th and the 14th century, uh, Nicephorus Humnos provides further theoretical discussions of catopterics. Finally, there is also Demetrius Triclinius, whose selenography stands apart as it suggests the use of a mirror experiment. Triclinius states that the moon is a reflective and a mirroring surface and further argues that the lunar body receives the impression of the Earth's relief and oceans. And that this is why we observe a black anthropomorphic figure on the lunar surface. Uh, and here I'm showing you, this is the second oldest copy of his treatise. So this is from the final four quarter of the 14th century. The earliest copy is from the third quarter and it doesn't, and it doesn't contain this, uh, this uh, depiction of the dark spot on the moon. So only in the second oldest copy, we see that. Um, and Triclinius goes to explain that as the sea in the inhabited part of the earth is shaped as a human figure, so is its reflection on the moon. And as Karen knows much better than me, and she can tell you about this, uh, there is a long and rich tradition uh, that discusses the mirroring qualities of the moon. And then within that tradition, some authors would accept or reject the hypothesis that the dark spots uh, on uh, the lunar surface are in fact reflections of either the terrestrial, um, the terrestrial land or water masses. So there's a lot to be said about this and we can discuss it later in the Q and A. Having explained, why we see a dark human shape on the lunar surface. Triclinius proceeds by describing the apparent rotation of that figure of the, on the moon as the moon crosses the sky. And according to him, during full moon, 
the figure appears standing upright at moonrise, outstretched sideways as if lying down at moonset, upside down, and that is with feet towards the North Pole when below the horizon, and again upright and head towards the North at the next moonrise. The apparent change of orientation of the man on the moon can be observed while the lunar disk is above the horizon, but Triclinius also attempts to address the issue concerning the continuous rotation of that figure after moonset. So does this continue being the case when the moon is below the horizon and we cannot see? And I uh, quote from his uh, treatise, here's the Greek and I read my translation. When the moon is below the earth and is traversing the parts below, the head of, the, of this figure is downwards, whereas the feet appear to be looking upwards towards the pole. Thus we, know, thus we know that this happens so with the help of a mirror until when the moon would arrive again above the horizon, this human-like figure stands upright as before. This is the first time that Thessalonian men mentions using a mirror to determine the appearance of the dark spots on the lunar surface when the latter is no longer visible. For a long time, when I first read this portion of the text, I thought that Aquinas was referring to a thought experiment because I was, it was certainly impossible for him to install such a large mirror so high as to allow him a view of the moon after it, it had set below the horizon. It nevertheless bothered me that the second description of this so-called experiment with the mirror was described in no uncertain terms by the Clinius as something that he had tried and the readers could repeat themselves. In this next portion of the treatise, he first acknowledges that he is not able to confirm whether the dark figure remains on the lunar surface when the moon is below the earth and possibly in its shadow. Then he details how his mirror observation might be repeated. It is important to note here that his mirror experiment does not address the problem of whether or not the lunar surface displays the reflection of the terrestrial terrain while the moon is in the Earth's shadow. That's a topic he doesn't discuss. The experiment is only designed to demonstrate the continuous apparent rotation of the figure on the moon. And again, I'm showing you the Greek and here I was lazy to type it in. So you see a screenshot of the edition and I read you my uh, clumsy and possibly wrong translation. And so such figures are visible when the moon traverses the hemisphere above the earth. If it is positioned below the earth, it is not at all safe from its shadow. And I'm unable to say also whether the experiment with the mirror would show to us that the moon always has them in like manner. For when these figures are not there, it is likely that the moon has become unshaded or that when the, those shadows or reflections, their return, the figures appear. For one is not able to inquire clearly concerning this unseen phenomena. However though, however, though, if someone would wish to gain what I call clearer knowledge through the experiment with the mirror, Having assumed the present figure of the moon with the head turned in the direction of the pole, feet towards south, and taking up in their hand a big mirror and lifting it up high, carrying it above, they should go around starting with the figure from the moment of rising above the horizon, so that the shadow of the assumed hypothetically figure would manifest itself in the mirror until, as they go around in a circle, they reach the place where they had started. And if they would position a man on his back and, uh, and if they turn the mirror around according to the aforementioned way, and from this, they would know whether this is true. Admittedly, this passage is not immediately clear and my translation is very clumsy. It does not help that Taglinius is being purposefully, perhaps ambiguous, uh, as throughout the selenography, he uses the word skia both in its primary meaning as a shadow and, its, and in its secondary meaning as a reflection, a mirror image. In terms of its graphic properties, the drawing of the lunar surface and its dark spot, the one that you saw, um, this one, um, in, uh, in uh, the Pagizinus uh, Grecus 2381, 
So in terms of its graphic properties, this drawing represents the anthropomorphic figure as a shadow rather than a reflection. The latter traditionally is rendered geometrically as a subject of catoptrix rather than in pictorial and figurative terms like in this case. At the same time, Triclinius' argument explaining the appearance of the man of, on the moon clearly invokes and relies primarily on the second meaning of skia, namely that of a reflection. He explains that these dark spots are a reflection of the Earth's oceans. I mentioned that initially I considered this to be a thought experiment and this large and rotating mirror, merely a hypothetical mirror that he describes. Indeed, rotating mirrors with what is possibly a universal joint are mentioned in William of Merbeck's Latin translation of Pseudoptolemy's De Speculis, uh, section 17. We also know of the popularity of cast bronze mirrors in the Eastern Islamic world uh, during the 12th and the 13th centuries, such as that, for instance, uh, made, the one made for the Artuket ruler Urtuk Shah in the first half of the 13th century. It's preserved in the David collection in Copenhagen, and you can see it online. And I mentioned this mirror because it's a mirror that I actually know, um, and it is one of the largest preserved mirrors. Um, and here again, I will stop sharing and reshare so that I can show it to you. So here is the mirror. Um, this is 24 centimeters in diameter. And the second reason I'm mentioning it because I have had the privilege to handle it, uh, thanks to the curators in the David collection. And while it has no handle at present, I can uh, testify that such could have been inserted in the central node, or alternatively, this mirror could have been suspended or hanged through uh, some kind of fabric or cloth or leather strip uh, that, that could be inserted through the same central node. And I can say that it is a heavy mirror, but at the same time, it was possible to lift it with one hand and also to sustain it. And if Triclinius uh, writing a century later than the creation of that mirror, um, if he had in mind a similar instrument, then I asked myself, what did his experiment consist in? And let me return to my, um, to my, to my PowerPoint and to the Greek text. Currently, I am of the opinion uh, that the mirror was not supposed that one, the mirror that he uh, mentions was not supposed to reflect the moon itself. Uh, this makes no sense because the moon could actually be observed above the horizon and one could see how the figure rotated. I think the mirror was supposed to, in the experiment, was supposed to substitute for the moon, to stand for the moon as a mirror and thus to reenact its movement across the sky while reflecting the figure of a person standing in for the Mediterranean Sea, whose anthropomorphic shape, Triclinius argues, is what we see reflected on the lunar surface. By such a reenactment, Triclinius could demonstrate the apparent change in orientation of the reflected figure, both above and below the horizon. I might be wrong and misunderstanding the text, and this is also why I decided to discuss it with you here today. And I'm really looking forward to receiving your feedback. At the same time, however, I think it goes without saying that Triclinius' text is an important piece of the puzzle, which we need to figure out in order to understand the status of astronomical observation, illustration, and instrumentation, and the role they played in the study of the cosmos in Byzantium. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Thank you, Divna. Karen? Well, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Um, Divna, I think that was absolutely splendid. Bra bravissima, I, I really enjoyed that. And I think the work that you are doing is, is really, really important. Um, even if it's somewhat uh, rebarbative to have to troll through lots of obscure text, I, I think, you know what you and your colleagues are doing to um, to do that hard work and to to try and reconstruct um, the visual and material culture of Byzantine astronomy um, is really really important. Um, I'm very excited about this. 
um, particularly the man in the moon and and uh, your argument I think is very persuasive and um, so uh, really all that I will be doing in this response is in I suppose um, to, to suggest some ideas um, I work mainly in, in the classical period so to, to suggest some ideas mainly from classical antiquity also some uh, from from the later early modern period um, that I've become acquainted with, which might, I suppose, just cumulatively um, build up weight uh, on either side of your period and exert greater pressure uh, to make it all the more likely that um, the instruments, you know, that you're arguing for, that, that they were there and um, throughout uh, the Vantine um, uh, period and that they were in use. Um, and so to kind of buttress um, what you've been um, saying to us uh, in, in this past, uh, in this presentation. Um, I have a little PowerPoint, which it might be helpful if I switch to that. Maria, I don't know, uh, or Maria or George, can I share a screen? It seems it's the same. Uh, yes, Karen, I, that I can do it now. That's fantastic. So um, it's probably best if I just bear with me a second. Um, if I toggle, toggle screens here. Um, what do I have to do? Hopefully this will work. Uh, can you, see, you can see that now? Yep, yeah. great. Excellent. Okay. I don't know if it's in the exactly right format. Just bear with me. Do I have to? That's probably not great, is it? No. I'll go back. You're probably seeing the little bits on the slide, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, but one of the reasons I think uh, this is very exciting is because what you're doing, Maria, as you probably, or did now, as you probably well know, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of Maria with mirrors as well, um, is I mean, what you're doing uh, collides uh, very happily with uh, very exciting things that are happening in, uh, or about to happen in modern space uh, astronomical observation with the uh, launch, the planned launch of the James Webb telescope, um, uh, that the, famously the machine that practically broke NASA. Um, and I think it's scheduled for launch in November uh, 2021. And the reason that I'm very aware of this is because um, Johns Hopkins is, because uh, I think it, it was the, the, the site for Hubble, and it's now going to be the site for um, the, the, the James operations with the James Webb telescope. And this telescope, um, well, like all telescopes involves a, a mirror and you've got an image there of this extraordinary mirror. Um, uh, and I'll just read uh, from some of the blurb um, because this is well beyond my expertise, but just to describe what it, this is actually going to do. It says, I quote, the primary mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope is composed of 18 hexagonal mirror segments. You can see those quite clearly there, made of gold plated beryllium, which combine to create a 6.5 meter diameter mirror. Absolutely huge. And I think that photograph is nice because it conveys the, the, the scale of the thing. Considerably larger than Hubble's 2.4 meter mirror. So I've been, I've, from what I've heard, this machine is going to blast Hubble um, out of the water completely. Unlike the Hubble telescope, which observes in the near ultraviolet, visible and near infrared spectra, the James Webb will observe in a lower frequency range um, from long wavelength visible light through to mid infrared, which will allow us to observe high redshift objects that are too old and too distant for Hubble to observe. And basically what this means is we're going to be able to see with this mirror through this telescope, um, far, far more remote and therefore older, I guess, um, points of light, sources of light. And um, it's expected to bring us back to the origins of the universe and to be, um, to prize open the world of black holes in a way that we've, We've never, uh, we've never been able to access them before now. So mirrors and telescopes and 
astronomical observation, we're at a very, very exciting point in time to be thinking of this. Um, and actually, uh, we have at Hopkins, we're, we're hoping to launch a, um, a humanities sciences um, interdisciplinary project, um, one strand of which I hope I'll be able to entice you, Divna, to be involved in, because I think your work is really important. We're planning a project on, on the theme of cosmic visions. So, um, so I'm very excited about this. But um, away from the cutting edge um, uh, technology, futuristic technology, I wanted uh, also to, to reel back and think, um, think further back to uh, these connections between the moon and the mirror, um, which you've mentioned, and um, going right back to um, classical antiquity, um, you know, as articles in Maria's volume have pointed out, the connection between moon and mirrors, and as you yourself said, uh, is a very old one. Um, and going into traditions of magic and um, uh, various types of oracle readings, etc., mirrors being perceived to be an instrument that uh, offers us insight into other realms that are unseen. Um, and uh, a very good uh, a nice illustration of the connection between the moon and the mirror uh, in uh, the Thessalian trick uh, illustrated here, um, where the moon, well, it was believed that uh, mirrors could, in a sense, capture the moon and, and bring it down to Earth. Um, and there's also the, the, the Pythagorean mirror trick, where uh, writing on a mirror is uh, is thought to project it, I think, onto the surface of the moon. So um, these kinds of um, uh, associations between the moon and mirror uh, start in magic uh, and um, increasingly then in the scientific tradition, if I move on to, um, to give one or two examples. Um, this is one, uh, uh, a passage from Plutarch's De Facie, so the first century, um, of the common era AD and um, he's not talking about a mirror strictly speaking here but using a reflective surface um, in an experiment so a bowl of, of water essentially um, and looking at how the sun strikes the water and, and light bounces off it but you can see the sun itself reflected in the the, the mirror the, the water surface and um, Using that, and how, so this passage shows that um, that experiment with a reflective surface was used in the first century AD as a way to reconstruct the mechanism of heliophotism, where the moon was believed to be like a mirror, like the surface of water illuminated by the sun, just like the water was. So I won't read through the passage itself, but that shows us a very, I suppose, early example instance of I suppose the scientific use of uh, mirrors or reflecting surfaces to try and recreate what's actually what's actually going on there um, in the interactions between the celestial bodies themselves. Um, and if we move on two centuries to the um, Achilles Tatius, the third century astronomical text, um, he talks about you, the use of mirrors as a, again a way to help us understand lunar phenomena. Um, so this is a somewhat more straightforward passage where he says it is a, um, it's as if one, so holes pair, it's an analogy, as if one took a mirror and wanted to observe the reflection of the image from it. One will position the mirror directly opposite one's face, but then, so I suppose you see the full reflection of yourself in the mirror, but then if you were to slant the mirror and follow the slant and incline, you will observe two thirds of the face or half or a tiny reflection reflected back just as the moon is turned away. And so it is with the moon. Um, that looks to me like a, uh, the use of a mirror to as some way to re recreate uh, the phases, although actually I think this passage belongs to a section where he's talking about lunar eclipse, if I remember rightly. But nevertheless, it's evidence of the use of mirrors um, to help illuminate the mechanisms of the moon. Um, right. Yeah, um, so this, the use of mirrors, uh, this, I think Colin is with us, this reminds me very much of um, 
uh, what Colin uh, says about an analogical drift and about how um, the kinds of tools that were used to try to understand phenomena, then so the kind of heuristic and cognitive tools, then actually um, uh, became drifted into ways to conceptualize the object of study itself. So um, through the use of mirrors as a way to understand the moon, the moon then becomes understood as a mirror. There's a sort of a, an equation between the tools that are used to understand it and the object itself. And, and I think we can see that happening with moon uh, the moon and mirrors. And I think your Tritinius text just intensifies that association. Um, you also talked about um, uh, diagrams and representations and, um, and trying to reconstruct or uh, get back to some of this visual culture through text. And it just occurred to me as interesting to bring together some texts from classical antiquity, which clearly show um, the use of diagrams um, and spheres as a way to um, understand astronomical phenomena. Um, I, I won't have time to read through all of this, but this is from Lucian's Icaramenopus, and it's a, it's a kind of comic satirical dialogue and um, satirizing philosophers and scientists and astronomers. But it's very interesting, um, the, the use in this passage in particular, he's talking about um, how ridiculous it is that people who can't even, who can barely see the hand in front of their own face, they're so short-sighted, can then purport to offer us insight about the distance between the sun and the moon and you know phenomena that are way, way out there. Um, and he talks about at the end of the passage um, how they use, um, uh, they, they draw circles and triangles and squares and multiple spheres. Um, this is the Loeb translation, but actually, um, I think what the Greek there says, uh, spiras tinas poikilas. Poikilas suggests to me colorful, you know, like you were talking about, these, these multicolored spheres. So it's the use of drawing and artwork as a way to enhance visualization of these things that are impossibly remote or were impossibly remote in antiquity. So um, there it is in imaginative literature, an imprint of this really um, dynamic astronomical um, uh, material and visual culture. Um, and we have it, um, you also spoke about um, the more ephemeral um, astronomical um, instruments made of paper, um, for example. And uh, I was struck by this reference, again from Lucian, near the beginning of his dialogue, the Nigrinus, um, where again, uh, the imagery of, of sight and short-sightedness and eye conditions and um, uh, poverty of sight and blindness, that's it's a really important theme going throughout the work. Um, and he talks about uh, this philosopher who helps him see better in his soul, even if his eyes are physically afflicted. And when he f and encounters this philosopher friend, Negrinus, he says, I found him with a book in his hands and many busts of ancient philosophers standing around about. So kind of, you know, the sorts of accoutrements that an astronomer might have um, in their surroundings. And beside him, there had been placed a tablet filled with figures in geometry and a reed globe, um, says the translation, a spira calamu. Um, and I'm struck by this. Is this a papyrus instrument, some sort of ephemeral um, model um, that he says was a mimema to pantos, uh, a, a, a representation of the cosmos. So um, and to my knowledge, nobody has really uh, looked very much at this little um, reference, but it points to hints at the presence undetected, perhaps of a whole culture of ephemeral astronomical technology that is just obviously lost to us now. But that Lucian could be referring to it in this offhand way is really exciting to me. Um, and that brings me around to, uh, I suppose, going to the other side uh, to, again, something that I've become aware of um, only through uh, our the very exciting in, excited interventions of our special collections librarian at Hopkins, where we have acquired this thing, uh, which uh, he identifies as a paper supercomputer. 
It's from uh, Coronelli's uh, 1691 Idea dell'Universo, and it's a very small image there, but actually what you're looking at is, if you could see it, um, this is a, 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 a broadsheet with lots of six, I think, in total little uh, volvels, and these are all moving parts. Um, and what this object um, uh, shows us is, well, it, it's described in the catalogue as the ultimate example of early modern data visualization, which includes nearly every astronomical and astrological phenomenon uh, then known and important to mankind, including a calendar ring, uh, the 12 winds and zodiacal signs, calculators for the hour and minute of sunrise and midday, uh, as well as new moons and full moons, six calculators at its base for reckoning movable feasts, continental maps, global climatic zones, lunar mansions, and diagrams for solar and lunar eclipses, amongst many, many other things. And these are moving parts. So it's a bit like, um, I think of the Antikythera mechanism um, as an, almost an ancient sort of machine that correlates to this, but this is made of paper. Um, and I believe there are only two others in, in the world. I think one is in Getty, Getty and one is in Harvard, um, but they've been used. This one is pristine. Um, so uh, that just, I suppose, gives us some, um, again, some insight into that, uh, the world of paper astronomy, paper instrumentation. And finally, I couldn't pass over the opportunity to bring in my favorite passage, the lunar mirror in Lucian's Veri Historiae, but I think what you're doing with Tritinius answers a question that has puzzled me for some time. So this is the great, the great uh, passage where Lucian describes this, uh, what I think is the first, our earliest description of a lunar crater. And he describes it as a shallow well on the moon. And if you go down, you hear everything from the earth below. But he also says that hovering, hanging just above the well, there is this gigantic mirror which reflects and magnifies everything that's going below, on below, down on the earth. And he says, if you look into the mirror, you see all the cities and people just as if one were standing over them. And there's some kind of disconnect for me between, uh, you know, we're being asked to imagine somebody having gone down into this crater well, looking up at the mirror that's suspended above. And yet we're told that the experience of looking into the mirror and seeing everything reflected is as if you were standing above everything. And to my mind, this maybe hints at real experiments using uh, mirrors to look up at the moon and, and, you know, where you would be actually looking over the reflection that you were seeing in the, the mirror below you, if you see what I mean. So I think what you're doing is plugged right into a really exciting uh, nexus of um, material and visual um, astronomical um, instrumentation, which, as I've hoped to uh, to, to suggest very briefly, can be, we can trace right back to the fifth century BC at least, and brings us right up to um, the most exciting uh, breakthroughs of contemporary technology. So thank you very much, Divna. I look forward very much to reading more of this work. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, uh, th there's plenty of time for discussion. Uh, Divna, would you like to start by um, responding to the response or commenting, mm -hmm. and then we can open the floor? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I was, I'm, I'm very happy after hearing everything that Karen said and seeing all these um, examples. I, so I have many thoughts. I don't know if uh, they are very coherently ordered. I, I guess I'm just going to throw them as they come. Um, yeah. I, I, I was very, I'm very happy to see, you know, the, all the Lucianic examples. I haven't mentioned to Karen this because we obviously met just because of this lecture, but uh, uh, two years ago or something, I, I had already uh, read Triclinius and was trying to figure it out. And I went and did a very low key, low stakes presentation, which uh, went from Lucian to Triclinius to a short story by Tom Hanks the actor about a, trip, about a trip to the moon and back, or a, rather a trip around the moon. And this is when I read Karen's work on hyperreality and illusion. And then I, I was, um, 
I was thinking, how can we, you know, basically, how can we say something more about Lucian and its Byzantine readership, but not simply for its rhetorical and satirical sides, but also for this kind of, you know, in this kind of uh, framework of astronomical observation and, um, and astronomical instrumentation etc and i never continued that thought but i thought this is something important to do because lucian is very much copied in byzantium the manuscript tradition is very rich uh, but at the same time I, i've looked at into some of those codices and there are few there are not so many uh, readers notes so it's difficult to argue what what is it read for but i think there are other ways of arguing for uh, its relevance. And this uh, brilliant uh, example with, um, I, I, I hope I'm not mistaken with the, from Nigrinos, yes, with the, uh, with the Reed Globe. I'm thinking, okay, so this is written by Lucian, not at all Byzantine author, but then a Byzantine reader reads it and, you know, doesn't question the Reed Globe. Therefore, that's something uh, that is, read as normal and familiar maybe right so it's a it, 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 it this is a fantastic thing and i think basically the whole discussion about um curiosity and how you try to explain the world but you and and there is a cognitive hierarchy in which type of sense has prevalence and usually the site would be the first one okay so but then you have all these limitations and therefore you come up no matter which culture which period there are solutions that present themselves but because we work with historical material so that's why this kind of ephemeral data or you know examples of paper instruments and, and other such things the fact that they're lost, it doesn't mean that such uh, need was not present and solutions were not offered at the time. And I think really it's something that is difficult to discuss. It's dangerous to make uh, assumptions, but as Karen showed with her collection of Lucianic examples, actually they are uh, reasons to, to, uh, to believe that such things were used also for the uh, Hellenistic or medieval period. So I think that's one. Um, one thing that uh, we should really, really think about the, the nature of our evidence and the methodological difficulties of dealing with ephemeral, I know, ephemeral things. <laughs> um, and um, I think the other thing that comes to mind is, uh, of course, okay, I'm uh, passionate about Byzantium. It's what, and I want to say, okay, it has an important uh, role to play within this story in which it is usually omitted. But I think there is something also to be said about continuity of tradition that happens in, um, uh, in certain linguistic, uh, whether in Greek or in other languages. So if uh, traditionally history of science and technology perceives the Greek evidence as confined only to the ancient uh, or the classical material, now maybe this is a good case to open up the discussion also to subsequent material in Greek, which actually has something to offer and it's not merely a copy of the classical so i think that's another another point to bring uh, to bring up and um yeah i don't know about the lucianic mirror on the moon but uh, i will think more about this and talk to you karen about it <laughs> i'm just i'm just gonna say i can feel an article a, a collaboration cooking Divna. <laughs> oh definitely um and the final, uh, just final thought that I, I, I just remembered now, I think there's also about uh, a lot about to be done in terms of reflection, because you had these examples that talk about the reflecting surfaces, water in particular. So um, it is not uh, necessary to think simply of mirrors as artifacts that we have or don't have. And I know from experience, I have been very frustrated with having only cosmetic mirrors, you know, like uh, in museums and never any, any other type of mirror. But it, it is actually true that surface, it can be a water, it can be a gold, gold sheet in a manuscript, right? Or it can be a marble surface. If it, is a if, it, if it is a reflective surface, it is a mirror at the same time, but it has different properties. It loses light differently, et cetera. So I think especially, Usually art historians and architectural historians are engaged in that conversation, but perhaps that's another collaboration we can seek and talk to them about reflective surfaces in those cultures and periods and 
what can we say about uh, purposefully uh, uh, constructing surfaces so that they can reflect light and how does this connect then to texts we read and try to interpret? I love that idea. I love that idea, bringing art historians into the discussion. Thank you, Arvon. Um, these are all great historical questions. Um, any questions from um, the audience? Can I also say just what uh, Leontius Mechanicus is in my mind as well, um, as someone who talks about, he has a whole, um, a whole essay on the sphere of erratus and on constructing spheres to try and um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? To try and reconcile, to, to try and make them conform to the description of the night skies that are found in Aratus's phenomena. And he talks about how, well, there are lots of spheres around at the moment which are which conform to Ptolemy. But if we want to use Aratus as our source, and we need to, I mean, it's exactly what you're talking about. It's using instruments to help visualize, in this case, what is in um, Aratus's text. So he talks about how you have to make them. So, so that is also a, a really interesting one. I think Fabio Guidetti has just produced a, a new, a first, or a new critical edition of that text. Um, I think I can find the reference. So he's seventh century, I think. Isn't he? Mm -hmm. And I guess it's also important to mention that um, it's not that, like, that Aratus was uh, lost uh, for the medieval Greek readers, but there's this revival of Aratus uh, at the end of the 13th century, which coincides with the re-edition and revival of uh, readership of Plutax Moralia, where the Fakia is, and which is just proceeding in the generation just proceeding to the Clinius. So all these things are actually part of the same, um, yeah, the same cultural effort. Wonderful. John, I, I think uh, you've got a question. I do, yes. Okay. Um, thank you for super paper, Divna. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm coming at this from a completely different angle. Um, uh, but, well, in two respects. First of all, Triclinius, to me, is an editor of Euripides. Um, and uh, so I see him as part of the, the creative period of Byzantine uh, editions, uh, where he's in, he's particularly interested in the rhythm uh, of um, Greek choruses. Um, but at the moment, I'm working on uh, manuscripts of Galen um, from a similar period, a, a, dif a different uh, Demetrius, Demetrius Angelos. Um, and I want to ask you something about the images in the, the Vaticanus Gracus 1291. But before that, just to make another link, which is um, you had the phrase uh, Econ Enarges, um, a, a clear image. Um, and all of Galen's work is not about the cosmos that you're looking at, it's about the microcosm of the body. Uh, but of course, the body is just as hard to see, the inside of the body is just as hard to see as the cosmos. And so you have to think of ways of working out how it goes. And Galen says, um, you need to start from ta enargo's phenomena, the things that are clearly uh, observable. So that is where Pera uh, will provide you with all sorts of data. So you have experiment, to give you all the data and you're using your other senses, not just sight, but smell and taste as well. And then you can move to the abstract uh, or to the theoretical. Um, and as long as you have the correct deductions, that's gonna lead you to a true understanding of um, how the pulse works or how the heart works and this sort of thing. So it's exactly the same uh, scientific method um, to, to theorize and visualize how something works that you can't actually get at. You ha you, it's, so it's not so much, it's a scientific method. But it seems to me it, it's working on the same principle of what you talked about with abstraction and observation. Um, and it's really interesting to see how important that is for Demetrius Angelos or Demetrius Triclinius, 
the 13th and 14th century in Byzantium were really interested in that. But if I could just ask you a, a specific question, um, I, I was interested in, in what sort of ink um, the, the black sky, what made it black, and what, what, are, what are the lines? There seem to be parallel lines um, on the hemisphere that you had. It looked as if it was in some sort of golden material. And I just wondered, do those lines have anything to do with the, the triangles or um, what, what Karen was describing from, from Lucian, that there were circles and triangles in representing something cosmic. What are those straight lines? On the on the image from Vaticanus Vatican Grigos 1291. Thank you, John. And also nice to meet you. <laughs> and um, I will share. Let's start from the concrete question, and I'll just share again so that we can see it as we discuss it. So I was showing you this one because the other one is more corrupt, uh, and so this is like the global view, right? Mm -hmm. And if we if we, so, so this this part is the zodiac ring, hmm. and then you would have the meridians and the zones of the celestial sphere. So these are the golden lines, uh, and th this is indeed gold. Right. And if you if you really zoom in into the into the painted surface of the globe, I think that's actually not black, but like really dark blue. I haven't seen it in a person. And uh, I don't know any anything more than what I told you that as far I think the colors in the indigo indigo mm. dark, but I don't know how this ink is achieved. Let's say, um, and I don't know if we if we look at the other side of the folio. So okay, it's a par it's parchment, but mm. you can see it doesn't really it doesn't come through very strongly, right? This ink, so it is care. And uh, the, the, uh, the second one here, here we have more coming through from the, from the ink on the other side. And here we have that one, which is more damaged. Mm. And that's basically what I know about it. Um, and I haven't, uh, so in terms of existing secondary literature, that I haven't found anything that tells me more than that. So I think to have more information, we actually we did we do have to study it now from this point of view. I think it is it has been neglected mostly because these two uh, these first four folia, it is known that they are there, so they're singletons which are bound together with the main corpus. And because there is the big debate of the dating of the main corpus to the beginning of the ninth century, so these are not uh, much later folia. They are also within the ninth century, but they, since they don't belong to that main body that people have just tried to date, nobody has really bothered very much them. Um, and I think we really have to basically look at them from a different point of view as important because they're really striking. I don't know of any other example such as this one. And then I think it's important that there is nothing on their backside. So you have, basically they are, they could be unbound and inserted anywhere in any mm -hmm. kind or even used as loose uh, leaves, right? And mm -hmm. I find that with elaborate, um, more um, diagrams would not be precise, but kind of illustrative diagrams in astronomical manuscripts. You have you get this that are singletons, you know, prepared on the one uh, elaborately prepared images. Of course, technically, I understand why they have been prepared separately and then inserted. But it is also true that since this is now already the case, they can be bound and unbound in all kinds of configurations. So this is also why I'm thinking of them as tools. Um, or that they could possibly be tools. And I really appreciate what you were saying about uh, the scientific method of starting from the what could clearly be observed and then moving forward to the abstract. And I think that makes sense. It makes sense that this is not a, the view of one author, but it is an understanding of an entire culture. And it says something about that culture actually being uh, scientific, rational, 
and modern, right? In this sense, that, uh, and which which actually absolutely makes sense. Uh, you um, that, that there is an impulse to understand the my, the body or the cosmos or just anything that is within creation for them, and it has been uh, uh, the legacy of the way. Um, Western scholarship has evolved that we in certain medieval cultures have not been perceived as rational, modern and scientific enough for us to assume that they have such uh, such notions and such understandings of scientific method. Uh, Thank you very under much. inverted commas. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't answer the question about the ink, but I, I, I know who I can ask <laughs> uh, or at least persuade that we should learn more about it. Thank you. Maria? Yes, I just wanted to ask about the role of fantasia here and what ty type of fantasia is being em em employed in, in this context. Because I guess it's it's important, I mean, the kind of fantasia that is being uh, employed by the by sometimes uh, scholars is the one that um, uh, defines also the type of the scientific method. And there are many uh, types of fantasia, starting, of course, with the Platonic one going on through the Philostratus, Neoplatonism, and so on. Uh, what, uh, what type do you think is, is being employed here, um, uh, Divna? Uh, well, to, to be honest, Aquinas doesn't talk about it at all. Uh, so this is me interpolating from other people who do in, in the same period. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has been an issue that I, I have struggled with. Um, in the same period, you have some authors like, for instance, Theodore Metohitis, who more explicitly reflect on that cognitive uh, process that's occurring when they observe the world. And uh, you would have, well, it's never simply Platonic or Aristotelian, but you would have the sort of Neoplatonic, let's say, uh, uh, thought being predominant in the among those 14th century or early 14th century authors after until the middle of that century. Mm -hmm. um, and, but maybe this is also a skewed picture because these are the kind of authors that I tend to read. And not, I, of course, I haven't read all of them mm -hmm. that uh, that are there. But um, I, I admit this has been a difficult question for me uh, to discuss, and I, I would appreciate if you have a suggestion how to approach it, because I, I I really don't know how to tease out the sort of meta discourse that they have over what they are doing and why they are doing it in such a way. Because Metohit is okay, he is very reflective. He writes these philosophical essays, but this is like a hapax. I mean, he's the first one. Uh, he imitates Plutarch, and therefore he does it, and nobody else does. And um, he's easy to take because he writes such a particular type of text, and he he has a, a series of six essays which they they go one after the other, and they're on perception and on the um, different senses, and they're he discusses their respective values for the for the knowledge of the world. But besides him, uh, there are other authors, of course, that also work along the same lines, but nobody else reflects in the similar in the same direct way. And I, I have found it difficult to deal with this because it like you say, it is important to actually know what's happening. And if we know it's happening, but how do I discuss a discourse that I haven't found written? <laughs> I see. I don't. I don't know. So, if you have any uh, any ideas, I appreciate them. Well, I'm not a bad sometimes. I mean, it's 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 in mean, the the no the, the Neoplatonic, and I think this you could see. I mean, people working on uh, science and technology in Byzantium, people like Nadine Shibila, for example, working on the Hagia Sophia. They 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 employ this Neoplatonic way of uh, the Neoplatonic type of fantasy, which is connected with, of course, with aesthetics. And at the same time, with noises, with intelligence and news, mm -hmm. and um, I guess I assume it's it's it's, it's uh, this is what is I mean here is it's 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 similar. I mean probably they use it's, yes it's um, it's uh, must be uh, very similar to the Neoplatonic use of uh, of the term. But that will be my general answer. But um, yeah, the particulars I cannot give you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, any, any other questions? Um, 
Okay, I, in that case, I've, I've got a last one. Um, um, so, Divna, with all this material that you have been working, what would you say is the, I mean, obviously there's no clear line between, um, let's say, science fiction and science, or, I mean, you know, we don't really know whether to put scientific within or outside of inverted commas, etc. But, um, um, you know, if, if you look at this material and you look um, back at sources in classical antiquity, um, many of these stuff, you find them being discussed in authors like Lucian, uh, in what is obviously presented by the author himself as a very imaginary kind of um, setting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you see, you know, when you look at this material, you know, in, uh, throughout different historical periods, you see that sometimes it's it's a very interesting thing how sci-fi turns in a very oblique and insidious way into science. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point, people will say that this is obviously what we can see in the moon. Can you see it? And people then will nod their heads and they will say, yes, we can see it too. So, um, um, I mean, uh, and I'm asking this because you're working on intellectual curiosity, etc. Is there, would you say, is there a line, is there a clear line or any clear lines where someone will say that, look, what I'm talking about is obviously serious stuff. You have to take my word for it. Um, it's not just my imagination. I mean, what, what, I mean, obviously it's, um, um, it's a ridiculously broad question, but what, what would you say? I think it's, uh, I, I don't know if it's a broad question, but I think it somehow uh, fits the, the Byzantine material because you have, uh, uh, although you don't have like, a, you don't have a Byzantine author writing Icaromenipus, uh, right? I mean, there is a Byzantine reader reading Lucian, but you have a culture, at least this is my impression, this is a culture that is extremely rhetorical and aestheticized. And therefore, if a text is produced, which we would recognize as a scientific text, because it's about astronomical this and that, or geographical this and that, or mathematical this and that, mm -hmm. uh, within that culture, that text is still a literary text bound by certain rhetorical rules. And uh, so it has, still has to be in good style. It still has to employ uh, let's say um, prose rhythm or verse, it still has to be aesthetically pleasing and performative. Um, and then we can add to this other aesthetic considerations. So it has been my, uh, the result I have been finding constantly, the first point is that uh, what we think or we would like to classify as science, because of course such strict disciplinary divisions are, makes no, make no sense in this medieval material, but in, in Byzantium, what we, you would call scientific literature is literature as well, rather than what you have in modern times, in our, in our contemporary times where you're not expected to read a paper on, uh, I don't know, on uh, quantum physics and that paper to be beautiful and, and a pleasant read, you know, so uh, mm -hmm. uh, we should not impose that on the, on the medieval material. So I think that's the first point that they sought such devices, even if the subject would be a more technical, let's say, subject. The second point is about the, per, I think, whether you would believe what somebody said, we will take seriously what has been written. Uh, that's something sometimes very difficult um, because it actually you do have a very performative culture and a culture where, I mean, the kind of text that we read, if we want to reconstruct some history of science point, of course, these are texts that are produced by a limited and very educated elite, which is very much dependent on the same uh, pool of patrons. And uh, because of the high performativity and uh, ritualistic nature of that culture, which is also dependent on a limited pool of patrons, you have this very competitive, uh, playful element among these few people who write those things. And therefore, it's sometimes really difficult to distinguish between, uh, or, or rather, everything is multi, is polyvalent, and uh, 
you have you would have people writing serious things while at the same time being ironic about it and uh, polemicizing another member of this or competitor same uh, learned circle so somehow i i'm not really answering your question but i think it your question picks upon the, the spirit of those uh, competitive individuals within the byzantine context and here i think it's also important to consider culturally how that society is set up until the later period you have a very centralized so until the 13th century you have actually a very centralized society where there is a Constantinople, the emperor, and this is where the power, the money, and everything comes from. And it's only after the Fourth Crusade and in the 13th century that you, you get this fragmentation where multiple centers are equally strong or weak, let's say, right? So you would have Mistras becoming important and the Saliniki becoming important because of that fragmentation of the empire. If you compare to, let's say, um, you know, the Islamic medieval world, you have many courts, many possible patrons across Eurasia. You have a more uh, networked structure, more no many nodes. It's not as centralized. Mm. And I think that's also part of what's why we mm. get the type of evidence from Byzantium, because it's very centralized um, culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Divna. Um, Thank so you, it's Karen. And, and thank, thank you, Karen, you. and um, um, Colin, hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, yeah, uh, Maria and